All right, welcome everybody. Um, so in this video, what I want to take a look at is just talking a little bit about creating YAR rules for the null mixer binary that we've unpacked. And I decided to use the unpack sample. That isn't always necessarily the, the best place to start, um, but I think it, it, you know, the sample and, and the whole process of analysis here provided us a, a good opportunity to, to discuss some YAR rule basics and then some kind of caveats around when to look for creating YAR rules and some other considerations. So if you're um, not up to speed on the null mixer analysis, uh, there's a whole playlist that I created. So I would encourage you to check that out and uh, take a look, particularly at the different stages. The first couple of videos go through the different stages of packing and unpacking and, and how we got to this point here. I will uh, make sure to also add it to the video um, as, a, as a card. Uh, all right, so let's just dig in. Now, um, you'll, you'll likely notice that I'm starting this presentation off in Ida Pro, and that might not be always the, the first place that you go when you're, when you're looking at writing a rule, but I think in this example, it provided some, um, some good opportunities. And one of those, you know, th that opportunity is that um, I'm, I wanna write a YAR rule that's based off of strings. I'm, I'm keeping it relatively simple for this demonstration. Now we could write YAR rules based off of code patterns, looking for sequences of bytes, and that's something that I'll do in a future video. Um, but for now, using strings is fairly straightforward. This sample, once it was unpacked, doesn't further obfuscate its strings. As you can see here, there's a number of them that I think will become good candidates and what I'll eventually base this rule on. That's not always gonna be the case. And using the unpacked sample, we also have to consider, you know, is that what we wanna detect on? There is often times where I am unpacking things, or maybe you're doing memory forensics, or maybe you're adding it to your sandbox where having Yara applied to memory dumps where, where these binaries could be unpacked in memory can be quite helpful. Um, if you're you know doing your scanning earlier on in the process, or earlier on when a binary is hitting a system, um, and it's still in its packed state, well, then this isn't gonna help. And I'll talk in just a minute about some, some of the reasons why I'm not doing that. Um, now, with this one, again, we have some pretty good strings. They're starting to emerge and appear in the code. And, and this, um, again, not to go back through all of the details, but this is the unpacked null mixer binary, and this is the entry point. This is the main, the main method, as you can see here. Um, oh, no. I'm not sure why that just undocked, but that'll work. Um, so as we scroll down, um, again, uh, you know, seeing some, some unique patterns here, uh, not necessarily will I use all of it. And, and I'll talk about that as we get the, put, start putting the signature together. Um, these patterns repeat, and I'm going a little bit quick just to keep the demo relatively short. I don't think I know how to make short videos, but I'm, I'm going to try. Um, and we eventually get down below. Now, if you, you know, keep in mind how, how this operates, uh, this null mixer has a, um, it's, it's, compressed with a series of different self-extracting archives. The first is NSIS, the next is 7-zip, and that final self-extracting archive drops this binary along with, along with all of the other payloads. So all it really needs to do is execute those payloads, which is what it's doing up above, and then it apparently, and I say apparently because I still haven't really dug too deep into this code. Um, there are occasions where looking at the disassembly does provide you with, with, with good insight without having to really you know, crawl through all of the, the disassembly output. Um, but here you can see that there are you know, certainly some, you know, some network activity. Now, we, we observe some of this in the network traffic. In, in fact, we created an IDS signature around that. But in addition to seeing you know, this portion of this URL here, um, if you look at this function, Right, and I'm just sort of making a speculation that this string being moved onto the stack and this string that they're likely this, this function here is responsible for making the HTTP request. So oftentimes when I'm trying to test that theory, I'll look at the cross references. As you can see here, um, there are a number of them. And every time I follow that cross reference, we have what appears to be a string, a substring that is part of a URL. And so if you just continue to trace these, um, most of them, as you're seeing, will take us to the point we were we were initially started that cross tracing, uh, you know, tracing those cross references. Um, but these last couple will provide a few more um, additional strings, and these could be something that maybe we didn't see emitted in traffic, and we want to add to our signature, or maybe there's something that we we just we don't really care about. So. 
when looking at the string, when, when, when evaluating these, much like the IDS rule in this, in this scenario, um, I don't want anything that's going to be potentially unique to that binary or unique to a campaign. I mean, unless I want to, you know, identify just that binary or just the campaign. But for this rule, I want it to be a little bit broader. So I'm going to ignore the actual key value and I'm going to use things like add install.php question mark key equals. Uh, similar to this one. And, you know, more or less similar to this. Now, this end O name open close bracket equals, you know, this timestamp looks hard coded. So you might look at, you know, a number of other, other null mixer binaries and go, yeah, this is always there. So therefore this makes a good string, or you might just use that portion of it. And if you, you know, go back to some of these strings I was pointing out earlier, we see this pattern repeat here as well. Right, so that just to me is a is a a stronger indication that if I use that portion of the string and ignore whatever comes to the right side of that equal sign, it'll probably serve me better. Um, kind of similar with the s o t e m a underscore one dot xe. Um, this might be a good string. It might not. Again, it depends a little bit on what you want your yar rule to do. Um, this could be just unique to a certain campaign. I haven't looked at enough null mixers to make that determination. So, you know, if I'm just trying to detect this one, I might roll with it. If I am a little concerned and I am that it's, it's unique to, to something, um, I might skip it all together or maybe, maybe use the dot text or the dot XE. I, I don't know. I mean, that's a pretty common pattern to find in, in executables. So, you know, maybe these just, while they might look on the surface to be unique and helpful, maybe they just aren't. Um, so here just as an example where Ida can actually help, we can actually see the strings, where they're used. We know 100% they're part of this null mixer um, capabilities. In fact, this traffic that we were just analyzing, we could probably go back and add to our um, IDS rule because in the IDS rule, the last video in the playlist, I didn't add any of this any of these potential URLs or these these actual um, resources, these pages. So that might be a way to, to make that uh, that rule just a little bit stronger, um, depending on what happens, I suppose, when it hits the host. Okay, well, that's IDA. I guess I just like using IDA. So what if we didn't want to use IDA? Well, we can certainly do use something like strings. And keep in mind that, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to keep this relatively straightforward. I'm using the strings that are available. I'm using the dumped executable. And I'm also going to limit the, set the, the minimum length of the string that identifies a little bit larger. I believe the default's eight. I'm gonna bump that up to 10. We're gonna let this run a little slow here in a PowerShell prompt, but we'll give it a second. All that output will come and then we're gonna scroll through it. now. Um, very similar to looking at these strings in, in Ida, you know, just dumping them with strings, especially a binary like this that has a lot of strings. It's, you know, you, it's kind of an art to determine which ones are important, which one makes, makes good candidates for our, for our Yara rule and then which ones aren't, they're just going to be common. They're going to be from libraries. They're going to be from, you know, normal sort of compiling process of an executable. Um, now this one has you know, multiple strings like this pthread mutex destroy, uh, libcurl pp.dll, some API calls like find window A. Generally speaking, um, those I think are going to be probably not unique enough. And so what what I'm going to do is scroll up uh, this min, some of these mingw paths, right? I, I don't know 100% where these come from, but I suspect they come from uh, the mingw libraries, or this was compiled using mingw. I, I am not really sure, but they just, you know, they, my gut says they're not going to be good for uh, unique enough for this particular instance. So I'm going to keep scrolling up. In fact, I'll grab the handle and, and speed things up here. And eventually we'll get to more or less the top where this all started. And then you can see here's our, our grouping of strings. Um, to include the strings that we already observed. Yeah, again, not always are those strings going to be ready to be viewed right in IDA. You might find that they are obfuscated. Oftentimes they are. And so using, you know, just plain ASCII strings like this doesn't always work. Uh, but here's a good example. And, and now we can see all of those URLs that we were looking at. Maybe we use this message equals no XEs found to run. I mean, th this, you know, this looks pretty unique to me. 
probably not the C2 node because I suspect that's going to change. Um, but you know, there we go. So, so strings could help us do the same thing that we just talked about in Ida. I'm doing that same, you know, that same process of trying to identify strings, but there's just a lot more noise that we have to sift through in order to find what is a good value. Now, there are some tools. Uh, eventually, I'll create some videos on uh, Yargen is one that I, I use on, definitely on occasion uh, to help uh, bootstrap this process and, and go through the binary to help. So if you're thinking, well, there's got to be a way to automate this. Well, there is. And we'll talk about that in a future video. But for now, um, this again, this sample just was a good sort of opportunity to talk about this manually. Um, now, when it comes to the Yara rule, well, I'm going to clear the screen and we'll switch to Visual Studio Code. Uh, you can see, really, it's it's building off of some of the basics that I've talked about on my channel. I have another playlist for Yara Basics, and this is this is really in that same spirit. Um, simple rule name. We have three sections: meta strings, condition, um, meta. I like to add the sample so that I can always find it. Um, of course, and I put my I put an author if I put this anywhere publicly, and then I also like to add a date just so I know if I don't have any other way of tracking when I created this. This could be a way to do that. Maybe uh, you're using a system that parses this metadata and it's a way to tag it. Maybe the import process does. But for anyone who's going to consume it, I like to add the date. Um, and then we have our strings. And, and again, our strings are, are fairly straightforward here. Uh, pulling off some of those substrings, you know, so stopping short of the values that might make that unique. So the O name and O name e, uh, uh, open close bracket equals. Um, report error, you know, key equals, add install, very similar, very similar, no exes. Um, you know, perhaps underscore one dot text or dot, you know, underscore one dot exe. Um, that might not be, you know, terribly unique in and of itself, but when you add it to, to the context of the other strings that you're checking for, it could help add additional, you know, kind of build into making that rule, your rule, um, you know, more, match more, more on the binaries that you're after. Uh, now, I looked up the docs just before recording. You know, we can, we can talk about strings. There's typically ASCII and Unicode or ASCII and wide character. Um, ASCII strings are one byte per character. That's what you'll see here. And, and I think probably the quickest way to show you this. Um, well, maybe not the quickest way, but uh, you can see that this, this is Ida's way of saying, hey, this is a string and here are the first few characters of that string. The DB defines a byte, and then here's our um, our characters. Here's a better way. Uh, there's our add install string, and you can see starting with 61, 64, 64, 49, and so on, there's, there's one byte per character. With a multi-byte, um, a multi-byte, with a wide character string, it's two bytes per character. And what you'll see then is if the you know if the 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 character only needs one of those bytes, that's basically a null byte built into then each character. And so you you do need to define if you are you know testing against wide character strings. So I'm going to add a video after this in the Yara Basics series uh, to cover and, and really get into a lot more depth with those concepts. So just something to keep in the back of your head if you're not familiar. Um, docs say this is implied. So if you don't define, it assumes ASCII character. So I don't think we need to define that there. M maybe there's a reason to. It's just it just I don't I don't know of one at this point. So uh, that looks good. You um, you have other modifiers such as no case. So if you want to eliminate, let's say for example, we didn't want to have to worry about these uppercase I's or or maybe the the case changing here, we could add no case. Uh, so that is up to you. And um, and then there's the condition. Uh, so the only thing left with the condition is just to decide, you know, maybe add a little bit more parameters to how this rule is going to match. This uint sixteen is saying uh, essentially that the beginning of the file is a PE file. It starts with the magic number 4D5A. Uh, just keep in mind the Indianness. That's why this number is backwards. And um, if that matches, then you know odds are it's a PE file. It's an executable. That's the kind of file we analyzed here. And then how many of your of your strings do you want to match? You know, do you want five of them? Do you want all of them? Do you want one of them? It's up to you again on what you feel is the threshold. And I don't I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule as to how many you should have. Um, again, I, I think it's just up to you. You know, you, you develop a 
an instinct for it. The more that you write rules, the more that you put them into production or use them to detect things, you know, you'll find that maybe you're, you're catching false positives. So then you go back and fine tune it. And then it's just, it's just a skill that evolves over time. Um, okay. With that, it looks like I'm got all of the syntax correct and we've got some strings. Now I might not always just go right to defining, you know, five, five, six strings. I might do two or three and then test three or four, then test and just continue to add on as I, you know, feel those, those, those additional strings help with the, you know, the ability of the rule to, to match the way that I want it to. Okay. Uh, to test, I'm going to use uh, Yara installed in windows. And then all we need is Yara 64 null mixer unpacked at Yara. So that's the name of the Yara rule file. And then our, um, excuse me, it's set up install dump, the target binary. Okay. Uh, there were no syntax errors. Syntax errors would have emitted an error message here. And you can see that it matched on the binary. Now uh, I have the, the, uh, the packed version. And as we might expect, it's not matching on that. Now that one was packed with AS pack. And so there are rules already out there for AS pack. In fact, detected easy has, has a rule for AS pack, although it's not, in, I don't believe it's in Yara form. Um, so I didn't think it was worth going through the effort there. I don't know if there's enough data within a packed AS pack binary to differentiate between what it actually contains. I suspect not. So really didn't, um, you know, I didn't see the point and backing up the YAR rule at this point, very similar. So here's detected easy. And here's that, here's the original, this original binary all wrapped up. You can see the first stage is, is NSIS data. And, and again, this was the first video in this series where we talked about this. Um, it's a self extracting archive. So the, the unpacked samples and all the, the payloads that it's going to execute, those are all compressed inside of this layer, which is compressed inside another layer. Once you decompress this, which is seven zip. So we could create signatures to identify NSIS data, much like you see here, right? Detected easy has a signature for this null, uh, null soft scriptable install system, but that's all it's really going to tell us, right? So in this case, really just getting to the end of this and getting the unpacked sample, I thought was the best opportunity to talk a little bit about YAR. And I, and I feel really takes the series to a, a logical conclusion, right? There's really nothing else we, that I would typically do with this at this point, perhaps if there was a configuration section, I might try to extract that, but you know, at, at this point, I don't think I'm going to do any more. So uh, what about further testing? Um, that's again, something that I plan on covering in another video, but I'll, I'll mention it briefly here. Um, I do have a series of binaries that I test against. Uh, it's a variety of things. Um, simply put, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, copy all the system executables off of a windows, my windows VM, right? Pretty much everything in, in windows system 32. Uh, I can, you can download payloads from malware bazaar and you can have different file types, Linux files, you know, APK files, um, executables that are, are other malware and just a variety of things that then I can take the rule. And I can tell Yara to, you know, recursively check against everything in this directory. And then what I want, what I'm looking for is matches, right? I'm not expecting there to be any matches. Um, in this case, I'm getting an error scanning. So I pro what I probably should have done, I'll stop this is, uh, well, maybe I won't. Yeah. What I, what I probably should have done is copied those all to uh, another directory. You know, and that's what I typically do. I have a directory on my desktop or wherever I'm doing my Yara development. Uh, and test against that. And then that way, if I'm seeing matches and files I wasn't expecting, I know that I probably need to fine tune my rule a little bit more. The patterns that I'm pulling out, the strings, the code patterns, whatever it happens to be, probably just aren't unique. So again, there's a rule, fairly straightforward, just using strings. I thought it was a good example to talk about that. Uh, any questions, comments, please leave, leave them below. Comments are open. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, um, I think this wraps up our Null Mixer series and uh, looking forward to talking to you about more Yara basics in future videos. Thanks for tuning in.